Please take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading to Daniel chapter 2, please. Daniel chapter 2. <clears throat> Daniel 2, and we're going to read verses 31 through 35. Verses 31 through 35, reading them responsibly as we normally do, beginning at around 31, then I'll read 32, we'll alternate until we end together on verse number 35 of Daniel chapter 2. And as our custom is, let's stand together for the reading of the scripture, all of us standing to read God's word, and let's begin together on verse 31. Ready? Thou, O king, sawest and beheld a great image. This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. And let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here this evening. Lord, we want to thank you again for the Bible and for preserving your words for us, that we have copies of the Word of God in our hands tonight. And Lord, we're asking you to make us very mindful of your words and give the Word of God our attention that it deserves. Lord, I'm praying that you'll quiet each of our hearts and that you'll tune our heart to your heart. That we'll all have ears to hear what the Spirit would say to his church this evening. Bless the special now, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. When I think of how he came so far from glory, came and wed among the lowly such as I to suffer shame and touch disgrace on Mount Calvary take my place it's then I ask myself this question who am I who King would plead and die for. Who am I that he would pray? Not my will, thine for. The answer I may never know. Why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he'd go. For you and I When I'm reminded of his words I'll leave thee never Trust in me I'll give to you A life forever I wonder what I could have done To deserve God's only Son To fight my battles till they're won Who am I? Who am I that a king would plead and die for? Who am I that he would pray? Not my will, thine for. The answer I may never know. Why he ever loved me so that to an old rugged cross he'd go 
for you am I. The answer I may never know. Why he ever loved me so. That to an old rugged cross he'd go. For who am I? Amen. That's good. Our Father in heaven, we bow before you in prayer now, and we thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you, Lord, again for each one that's made their way to the service this evening. And Lord, as we open up your word now together, we ask you to speak to our hearts tonight. We want to uh, glean the truths you have for us tonight from Daniel chapter 2. And Lord, as we look at the day in which we live and the time in which we find ourselves right now. Help us to focus and to concentrate on these proven principles that you give us in Daniel chapter 2. May it help us, may it encourage us. Lord, may it be a blessing to each of us this evening. Thank you for being a great God and thank you for being a God who's in control of all things. And Lord, I pray that you'd minister to each of us tonight as only you can through your precious word. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. <clears throat> America is in a... Is, is in a... No, I was going to say a bad place. It, it's not in a good place tonight. I think our nation's in pretty much of an upheaval. The, there are, there are, is a corrupt minority... And I, I say minority, but that minority is growing in America. I never thought I'd see the day where over a million people in America would say they'd vote for a socialist to be a president. But that minority have shaped the agenda of the majority for a long time now. <clears throat> we always, the majority, seems like we have to respond to the ruckus that's caused by the minority. And this hasn't just happened for the last few decades, as some might have you believe. It's happened for about the last hundred years. It was only a small minority of vocal educators that brought in secular humanism into our schools. That was in 1920s, by the way. Secular humanism, in case you may have heard the term, it's a, don't, don't let anybody kid you, it is a religion. It is a, in fact, the definition is, it's a religious worldview based on atheism, naturalism, evolution, and ethical relativism. You, you cannot be a secular humanist and a Christian at the same time. <clears throat> They're mutually exclusive terms. Now, that deception of secular humanism has taken over, not just the schools, but the government, the media, and in some cases, the church as well. Many churches have succumbed and, and um, changed their beliefs in order to fit in with the secular humanist agenda. There was just a small group of vocal film and television producers that have desensitized America to immorality and sodomy by the films they produce. They introduced nudity and sensuality and immorality to the American world and culture. And now, pornography grips the minds of millions due to the proliferation of the filth that you can get through television and the computer and the internet. And I think, <clears throat> you remember, there was just one person that got God and the Bible removed from schools. There was just one person that caused evolution to begin to be taught in our schools. Minorities. Because of the deliberate actions of the corrupt minorities, we can see America has become less civil, less moral, less rational, less governable, in fact, less like a nation than ever before. 
someone has likened it to more like a wild animal. And that's interesting in the light of Daniel when God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to become a wild animal. Daniel forecasted that as we read in his book. I want our leaders to govern. That's why we pray for our leadership. From the local level all the way to the top. That's biblical. That's right. There's times we must speak out against things they do or things they say, but we ought not to speak out against them unless we are praying for them. And sometimes it's so much easier to speak out than it is to pray for. The truth is, we just want the opportunity to preach the Gospel. We want the opportunity to present Jesus Christ to our generation. We want the opportunity to preach Jesus Christ to our nation. I believe with all my heart, Jesus Christ and the Bible is what our country needs. We don't need less of God, we need more of God. We don't need less of Jesus Christ, we need more of Jesus Christ. I believe He is what we need. I believe the Bible will open our eyes not to have us fall for the deception of secular humanism. I believe the hope is in Jesus Christ. I believe the Bible and knowing Christ helps you live a life of peace and satisfaction. In fact, the Bible says in 1 Timothy 2, when we pray for those leaders and those in authority over us, it says that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. You can live that kind of a life if we yield to the Spirit of God and follow His Word. And we can have that life, by the way, we have that life of peace and that life of joy by the Holy Spirit of God, by the Word of God, even though the world is spinning out of control. Even though the things of the world are going around us and everybody's uh, getting, uh, what, what's going to happen? What's coming next? What, what, what's gonna, what is Syria going to do? What is Russia going to do? What are these nations going to do? What's Iran going to do? And everybody gets all, all uptight about it and the Christian doesn't have to be. We'll show you some things about that this evening. As a nation, we're 241 years old, and our Constitution is being questioned, because now they, they say it's, it was written by white supremacists, white nationalists. That'll be one of the excuses they use to try to set aside the Constitution. Most of us realize that the America that most of us grew up in and knew will not be the America our children and grandchildren will know. The America we knew is crumbling, and we ought to be aware of that. The Bible talks about what's happening in our world here in Daniel chapter 2. In Daniel 2, what has happened is, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And as he dreams, when he, when he wakes up, and let me, let me preface something here. I, I did a Bible study several years ago about uh, what the Bible says about dreams. Uh, in the Bible, God would speak to people and give them visions and dreams, and God would speak to them. God does not do that anymore. Okay, God speaks to you and God speaks to me through His Word. You say, well, what are, what are my dreams at night? You know what your dreams are? You had too many anchovies on your pizza. Your, your, your dreams are, is your mind unwinding at night while your body sleeps. They, uh, I just read something this week in one of the periodicals we get that your room temperature of your room has a great deal to do with how you dream and the, the extent of your dreams. And, and, and there's a lot of factors to go into what you dream. Well, here, God is giving him a message. But Nebuchadnezzar gets a dream. The problem is he wakes up and he doesn't just describe the dream and tell me what it means. He can't even remember the dream. So he goes to his wise, wise men. I call them wise guys. He goes to his astrologers and he says, Hey, yeah, I, I got something for you. And they say, Okay. Uh, he says, I had a dream and I need you to interpret it. They said, Okay, tell us the dream. He says, I can't do that. 
you got to tell me the dream and the interpretation. And, and they said, nobody can do that. I mean, we can, you know, can I translate that for you? We can make stuff up, tell you what it meant, but we can't make up the dream. And so they're, they're in a quandary because the decree has gone out. If you can't come up with it, you're all going to be, I'm going to kill you all. It was a death, death warrant. Well, the word got to Daniel. And Daniel prays to God, and God says you can, he reveals the dream to Daniel, and so Daniel steps up and says, I can tell you what it is. And, and they're more than eager to push Daniel forward. Why? Saves their neck. Okay? So Daniel lets the king know, and this is what we read in verse 31 through 35. He tells him that you saw a great image. And then he describes that image and what it was. And then, starting in verse 36, he gives the interpretation of that dream. And let's read that, okay? Start in verse number 36 of Daniel 2. This is the dream, Daniel said. And we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings. For the God of heaven hath given thee a kingdom, power, and strength, and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the heaven hath he given into thine hand, and he hath made thee ruler over them all. Thou art this head of gold. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over all the earth. And the fourth kingdom shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaketh in pieces, and subdueth all things, and as iron that breaketh all these, shall it break in pieces and bruise. And whereas thou sawest the feet and toes, part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay. And as the toes of the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. <clears throat> so there's the interpretation of what he saw with the image. And I want to share three principles with you from this interpretation here and this image that Daniel saw. The first principle is this. Number one, every leader and every nation gets replaced. You saw the head of gold uh, being Babylon. And, and later on he said there's a, a breast and arms of silver and the belly and thighs of brass and then the legs of iron. And each succeeding kingdom was replaced. There's a continuity between the differing materials. They all differ in value and in strength. Notice there's a decline in value of the metals as you go downward. In other words, the metal, the value of the metal decreases as its strength increases. Now Daniel tells us these are kingdoms. And each of these kingdoms gets overtaken by another kingdom. They always get replaced. Failed kingdom after failed kingdom build on top of each other, somehow thinking they'll, they'll be the one to finally get it right and be the kingdom. But you know, it's all built, if you remember, on feet of clay. It's all built on things that is uncertain and unstable. And if all you ever build your life on are the principles of man and on the beliefs of man, you're going to have an uncertain and an unstable life. The only way to build your life and build it solid and secure and stable is to build your life on the rock, Jesus Christ. Security, somebody said, is mostly a superstition. It does not exist in nature, nor do the children of men as a whole experience it. Avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure. Life is either a daring adventure or nothing. Now in the head of gold, as you see, was Babylon. 
He said, he told Nebuchadnezzar, you are the head of gold. Babylon's kingdom was 605 B.C. to about 539 B.C. They were taken over, and you see this even in the book of Daniel, by the Medes and the Persians, the Media Persian Empire. They followed the arm. They were the chest and arms of silver. 539 B.C. to about 331 B.C. Over 200 years. Then Greece took over. The thighs of bronze is Greece from 331 B.C. to about 168 B.C. Then you come to the legs of iron and that is Rome, the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire from 168 B.C. to about 476 A.D. Almost 700 years. The feet and iron of clay is from 476 A.D. to the present day. That, that is, and we'll talk about this in a few minutes, that is a mixture of kingdoms. We have no reigning empire right now in the world. We have different nations that are strong, different nations that uh, you call the, maybe they call them the, the, what do they call that, the G7 summit, or the, you know, the, the big, big seven nations, or the big powers of the world. And uh, they gather together and they think that they're the, 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 the big shots now. But <clears throat> Daniel is, is letting us know something. Don't, I, I don't get caught up in all the different kingdoms, but the fact is every kingdom got replaced. Every kingdom gets replaced. Nobody lasts forever. The kingdoms of the earth are crushed and blown away. Uh, in fact, he said in the interpretation, he said that they are uh, broken to pieces and become like the chaff of the summer threshing floors. They get blown away like the wind blows the chaff of the wheat away. It just comes and goes. And so they're crushed and blown away and lives are destroyed. Now listen carefully. Author Tim Woodruff said, We live in a world that has shaped our priorities, skewed our perspectives, and taught us what to value. Rather than permitting God to challenge our values, to confront and replace them, a great deal of energy is expended in the attempt to win God's approval and support of the values that God actually detests. In other words, we want God to baptize our standard of living, our pursuit of financial security, our accumulation of money. We want His approval of large houses and large bank accounts and large credit card limits. We want Him to look at our consumer culture, our capitalistic dreams, and say, it is good. But it's trying to impose on God a value system that is foreign to His very nature. It is culture dictating the shape of our faith. We are culture's collaborators and you can say well God bless America but I want you to know when the stone that comes down that's made without hands cut out without hands when that comes down America gets crushed too we want God has never promised to bless the American way of life God has never promised to bless the American dream we want Him to. We want Him to put His stamp of approval on it. But that's not what God stands for. One great kingdom follows the next and one goes after another until they all get crushed to powder by God Himself. America, arguably, is still the most powerful nation on earth. But you know, it was only 120, maybe 130 years ago when that was probably England, not America. Go back a bit further and it might have been Spain. So what about the future? It's obvious, I believe, if you know Bible prophecy, that America will be replaced. I don't believe America is talked about in Bible prophecy, certainly has not of one of the world powers. Now that's, that's hard for Americans to swallow. 
but it is not, should not be hard for a Christian to swallow. Every king and every nation eventually gets replaced. And we have to be careful. We have to be careful that we don't blend together patriotism with spirituality. We have to be careful we don't blend those two together and say because you're, spirit, because you're patriotic, you're spiritual, and because you're spiritual, you're patriotic. You have to understand there comes a time when God's going to deal, and I believe He's already started to deal with the United States of America. And we have to be sure when that, when that comes down, I'm on God's side first, not America's side. They, they, criticized, uh, they criticized a Muslim, I believe, because he said if it ever came down to allegiance to America or allegiance to his religion or to his belief, he'd side with his belief. And they criticized him, but would not we be the same way? Wouldn't we as believers say the same thing? That we have to obey God rather than man. That is where our allegiance is. And so I understand that every king and every nation eventually gets replaced according to Daniel chapter 2. Principle number 2. It's God who sets up the leaders of the nations. It's God who sets up the leaders of the nations. Look in chapter 4 of Daniel, would you please? There's several verses I want you to see. Chapter 4 and verse 17. <clears throat> this matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent, now watch, that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will and setteth up over it the basest of men. Drop down to verse number 25. That they shall drive thee from men and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field and they shall make thee eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Look at verse number 32. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and shall make thee eat grass as oxen, seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever He will. When you, before you get to chapter 4, when you read chapter 3, it's the chapter of the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar making the big idol of himself, big image of himself and asking people to bow down to that image. In fact, if you notice in chapter 3 and verse 15, Notice he says, notice when he talks about when you hear all the kinds of music in chapter 3 and verse 15, you, you bow down and worship the image which I've made. Notice towards the end of the verse he says, but if you worship not, you'll be cast that same hour in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. Now notice what he asks. Here's the question. Who is that God that shall deliver you out of my hands? Chapter 17, the, the, or, or I'm sorry, verse 17 that, of course, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, we're not careful to answer thee. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace, and He will deliver us out of thy hand, O King. What incredible pride. Do you hear the pride of Nebuchadnezzar? What God is there that can take you out of my hand? Proud. Very proud. Chapter 4, God exposes that pride and humbles him, really humiliates him. But you notice three different times, God said that he sets up over the kingdoms whomsoever he will. And, and in fact, in one verse, he says he sets it up over the basest of men. So you understand, Nebuchadnezzar only has the power that God has allowed him to have. That, it's interesting, I'm told the literal translation of that phrase, the basest of men, means he makes leaders out of the morally destitute men. Think we've seen that come to pass? The basest of men are often rulers of great nations and empires. 
You can go through history and you'll find that some of the most defiled and wicked individuals and had great posi positions of great power. Whether it's Mussolini in Italy, Hitler in Germany, Stalin in Russia, Mao Zedong in China, Idi Amin in Uganda, Saddam Hussein, Fidel Castro, Castro Kim Jong-un in North Korea. I don't remember what night it was. One of the nights my wife was watching something on television. I don't know what channel it was, but it was a history of some of the presidents of the United States. We've had some pretty wicked, immoral men hold the office of the presidency. What we, what we have today is not that much different from what's been there before. It's just more publicized than what it's been before. You can go through the 45 presidents in American histories. You're going to find characters that include slave traders, adulterers, fornicators, drunkards, backstabbers, men full of pride and self-importance, many of them with their greedy hands out to take all they could from their country. But those men have not just occupied the White House, they occupy Congress as well. That's why the place has affectionately become called the swamp. But you must remember, and I must remember, that behind every human election of men to the offices of our land, behind every election is a God who rules in the kingdom of men and gives it to whomsoever He will. We heard just a clip last night. I, I can't remember what program it was. They, they just broke to a little clip of Hillary Clinton speaking at some event and she just mentioned again the election in November of 2016 and she says, and I'm still trying to figure out what happened. There were, and by the way, she's not alone. Well, how do you explain what took place? The only way you explain it is the Most High rules in the kingdom of men and He sets up over it whomsoever He will. They don't want to calculate God into that, so they're trying to figure out some other way. Something else surely had to have happened. But to God, putting rulers in or ruling out is as simple, as simple as us moving pieces on a chessboard. Or moving checkers on a checkers board. It's, it's just it removes one and puts another in its place. I don't think it's somebody's talent. I don't think it's their excellency. I don't think it's their ability, Brother Bob, to run a great campaign. It is God that puts them in and takes them down. He elevates and He humbles. Because the basest of men, those destitute of moral character, they, they grope about in darkness. When the Bible talks about darkness, it means they have no spiritual direction at all. The Bible says we walk in the light as He is in the light. When you have light, you can see where you are going. When it's dark, you don't know where you're headed. You can't see. And when men are walking in darkness, it means they're walking without any spiritual direction. God is light and in him is no darkness at all so God is light and so they don't have any light they're not acknowledging God at all so they're on their own and a lot of times when that's why it's so simple when those of us who are in the light we look at something and say man how can you not see this how, how can you believe what you're saying it seems so obvious to us as they stumble about in the dark and 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 they they seemingly all want to drink from the same cup of political corruptness I mean, it just seems simple to know that we need to secure our borders. That just seems so easy to see that, uh, that, that, that <laughs> overtaxation and overregulation and is harmful to our economy. It, it seems to me, it just seems, it just seems so simple to see you don't spend more money than you take in. That's just so easy to understand. Uh, how do you get a national debt of some $20 trillion? And you just pass another budget and put you a trillion more in the hole. How do you keep doing that? 
Common sense says that just doesn't work. Common sense says that sanctuary cities are immoral and they're wrong. It just takes walking in the light to know that the government's supposed to protect its citizens, not illegal aliens. Or the other night, somebody said the word illegal should never should only apply to actions, not people. I don't understand that. See, that's to someone in darkness that must make sense, but to someone in the light, that's just ludicrous. You're illegal. If you're here without the proper what means of coming to America, you're here illegally. It's common sense. Hey, it's just so simple to understand, isn't it? That that you're born either a male or a female. This all this transgender and uh, you know LBQ, all the letters that they put. You don't understand? That's uh, that's not. You know why? In the beginning, God created them, male and female. End of discussion. That's what you are. It's only. It doesn't take. It doesn't take much light to to understand that we shouldn't murder our children through abortion. That that's murder. Fail to protect them from murderers that are in our schools. Common sense says that it's a, uh, that that the citizens ought to be well armed to protect themselves against the tyranny of a government. That's in the Constitution, by the way. And somebody says, "Oh, we ought to take their guns." You have a little problem. You have something called the Constitution of the United States. The foolishness that is bound in the heart of those who don't want the light. They walk in dark. They don't even walk in darkness. They stumble in the darkness. But guess what? God's at work anyway. God's at work through it all. They may stumble around like a drunkard and rave like a lunatic about open borders and classless societies. And they rail about homophobia and sexism and racism. At the same time, they're promoting them all. They're hypocrites. They're absolutely hypocrites. But understand, I, I think we have a responsibility as a citizen of the United States to vote in the elections. I think as a citizen, we should vote. We have a voice, we have a say, we should exercise that. And that is right and that is proper. As a Christian, I pray and say, God, your will be done. God, can, God puts them in, and listen, there are times somebody says, well, it doesn't matter if I vote or not, God will put in who He wants. No, you know what? Sometimes God, God gives people what they want. And he, he'll, he'll give them what they deserve. Every king and every nation eventually gets replaced. It's God who sets up the leaders of the nations. And let me give you principle number three, third proven principle. Only God's kingdom will ultimately last forever. Only God's kingdom will ultimately last forever. Uh, pick up in chapter 2 again, if you would, please. In chapter 44, I mean verse 44. Chapter 2 and verse 44. In the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms. And it shall stand, how long, church? Forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, and the gold. The great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. The dream is certain, and the interpretation thereof sure. Remember, every king and every nation eventually gets replaced. God chooses the basest of men to put over the nations of the world. We're witnessing all that presently. But there's coming a kingdom that's going to be the kingdom of God. It's going to be the kingdom of Christ. And God's going to establish that kingdom. 
And Jesus Christ is going to rule and reign on this earth. We call that the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. You know, the, the great thing about this is this. We don't have to straighten out the world. That's not our job. What's our job? To go preach the gospel to every creature. Somebody says, oh, we need to change our world. The Bible never tells us to change our world. world, world this whole world's going to burn up anyway. What we're to do is get the gospel to people. Spread the word of God and preach Jesus Christ. Remember, it said talks about the, the stone cut out of the mountain. The stone cut out of the mountain. Who's the stone? Yeah, it's Jesus Christ. He's the rock. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. That's not Peter. That's Jesus. The, the rock is Jesus Christ. Christ was the rock. 1 Corinthians 10.4 tells us. The rock even in the wilderness for the children of Israel. The rock that comes down hits the feet. Not the head, Babylon. Not the chest and arms of the Medes and the Persians. Not the stomach and thighs of brass, which is Greece. Not the legs of Rome. Instead, the rock stripes that the feet. That's the, that's the nations that are alive and are ruling right now in our day. It's, it's a mixture of nations. It's a mixture, if you remember, the, it's the iron mixed with clay. Verse 42, the toes of the feet were part of iron, part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. For many years they thought there would be a coalition of European nations and when the European Union was announced, everybody thought that's, that's going to be the thing. And, and it still might be. And in 1981, Greece became the tenth nation to join. And everybody thought, that's it. There's the ten toes of Daniel's beast and Jesus is coming again. Well, since then, 18 other nations have joined. There's now 28 nations in the European Union. So unless, there's, unless he's really a weird image, he's got 28 toes, we got some issues. But listen... What's interesting about the EU, and some of you who are up on some of this, you know this. They share a currency. But they each, each individual nation maintains their own wage and tax systems. They each spend and borrow on their own terms. They each have their own fiscal policies. In other words, there's no central fiscal policy. That's why you're... Uh, I haven't heard much of it lately, but Greece was in real trouble. And probably still are. There was a, there was a period of time when Greece, just whatever, whoever had money in the bank, they, they took like 40% or 50% of it. They didn't ask you. They just, you just went, when the banks, they closed, and when they opened up again, you had half of what you had before. They took it to try to pay off their, bit, their debt. And, and so now they're, they're looking. In fact, let me give you a quote. This is, this is from the Vice President of the E-Economic Union Commission, Joaquin Almunia. And Joaquin said this, Many EU leaders have suggested the best way to resolve their current problem is to bring members' budgets and fiscal policies together under the control of one federal body. Unless Europeans agree to complete economic and monetary union with a fiscal union and with a strong governance, with a feeling that some political decision should be adapted or adopted in common by those who are sharing the single currency, we will not succeed. So they realize we've got to consolidate this. We've got to all come under the rule of one thing. And, and by the way, the one who I think who's going to do that for them will be called the Antichrist. He'll come on the scene. He'll be the economic wizard and he'll solve their economic problems. So it's all happening. 
just as the image of Nebuchadnezzar, his dream contained metals that degraded as they descended from the gold to the iron and clay. The world that you and I live in increasingly becomes worse and worse. Decadent and decaying. Violent and immorality. Increasingly more apostate and materialistic. And really the only vehicle to control the violence is more and more of a military presence. We're seeing that across the globe. Daniel is one of the few books in the Bible that gives us a glimpse into the end times. I believe we're in those times. Now understand, people in the Bible thought they were in the end times. I think they expected Jesus to come soon. The toes in these nations that are kind of loosely gathered are, are what some believe to be the revived Roman Empire. The present day European Union. The, the ten toes are equivalent to the ten horns in Revelation 17. They just have to have somebody rise up and become the leader of those ten horns. But I'm not looking for the Antichrist. I'm looking for the Christ. I'm not looking for that dictator. I'm looking for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. The rock cut out without hands is coming. He's going to establish His kingdom on earth. Now, let me say this. The Bible speaks of a snatching away of believers. An event that happens in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. There's a word, we call that the rapture of the church. The word rapture is not in the Bible. But it means a snatching away. And that's what First Thessalonians 4 talks about. It's an event that, that needs no signs. None of these things we talk about have to happen for Jesus to return. He can come back any moment. That's why the Bible says that we need to be ready. We need to be watching. We, in such an hour as you think, not the Son of Man cometh. And so we're, we're always looking for Him to come. And, and none of these signs have to take place for that to happen. Once the rapture takes place, then the time of tribulation takes place on this earth. The time of tribulation has nothing to do with the church. We're the church. The time of tribulation has to do with the Jew. God, God dealt with the Jews all the way up until Jesus came. Jesus came unto His own, but His own received Him not. And when His own refused Him, the Gospel would go to the Gentiles. That's us. Now, that's the church age. That's the bride of Christ. And God, if you, if you will, dealt with the Jews until they rejected Christ, and now He's set them aside for a time, and He's dealing with the church. That's us. When the rapture takes place, the church will be taken to heaven. Okay, Now we'll be in heaven, and God will once again resume His dealing with the Jew. And that's what the tribulation is for. It's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And He's going to deal with the Jews during that tribulation period. Now, the world's going to suffer. Absolutely. Because, listen, in thee shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. I'll bless them that bless thee, and I will curse them that curse thee. But still, uh, that, that hasn't changed in God's time. And so He's going to deal with them. After that seven-year tribulation, we're coming back to earth with Jesus Christ. And that's when He'll set up His kingdom. He'll put down the forces of Antichrist who will have gathered to fight one last battle against God. And He will... He will it, 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 I hate to even call it a battle. The Bible says He just... Uh, a sword comes out of His mouth He just devours them all. I mean, that's not even... Not even a fight. We just watch it all happen. 
And, and then he sets up his kingdom and will rule and reign with Jesus Christ for a thousand years. Won't it be a great world when he's in charge? Look at chapter 2 and verse 46 and we'll be done. Then the king, Nebuchadnezzar, fell upon his face and worshipped Daniel and commanded that they should offer an oblation and sweet odors unto him. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. And he promotes Daniel. The king made Daniel a great man. I got news for him. Dan was already a great man. And gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Now the sad thing is, by the way, this doesn't mean Nebuchadnezzar got saved or Nebuchadnezzar believed in God. He just made the announcement. Because you find out in chapter 3, he's building himself an image, making everybody bow down to him. In chapter 4, God has to humble him and, and, and try to rid him of his pride. But you know, every, every king, every nation gets replaced. It's God who sets up leaders of nations. And only God's kingdom will ultimately be forever. You know the good news is? We're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. It doesn't matter what goes on. You know what? God's plan is in effect. God is in control. It will go just as God says it will go. And will follow however He leads. I'm on the winning side. So are you. Praise the Lord. Let's pray, shall we? Father, take the truth this evening. Thank you for Daniel and for the things we learn about these end times. Lord, we're, we're mindful that you set up kings and you remove kings. We're mindful, Lord, that you use nations for a while then you replace them with other nations. But God, we're thankful that there's coming a day you taught your disciples in the model prayer, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done. And Lord, I pray that Thy kingdom would come. And Lord, we're thankful that we serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You're a mighty, awesome God. And Lord, when the world gets afraid and they get fearful and they get panicked, they're not sure what to do. May there be a peace in our heart. May there be a settledness in our life because we know the one who's in control. May it be a great testimony to them. May it give us opportunity to tell them, don't base their life on the miry clay. Base it on the rock, Christ Jesus. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I realize a different kind of message this evening. But I wonder tonight how many would say, Preacher, the Spirit of God spoke to my heart tonight. Something in the message there about these principles that were a help to me, were an encouragement to me, were a comfort to me. And Preacher, God did speak to my heart tonight. Pray for me this evening. Would you slip your hand up tonight, Christian? Yes. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. Father, we thank you for speaking to hearts this evening. Thank you, Lord, for a man named Daniel who was yielded to you and to whom you revealed these things. Not just for Nebuchadnezzar's sake, but I think for our sake. You included them in your word that we might have the truths that we've gleaned this evening. Lord, tonight, I pray before we go home, these who have spoken to our hearts, we just bow our knee and say, God, thank you that you're in control. Thank you, Lord, that the, one day the kingdoms of this world will be the kingdoms of our Christ and of our God. And he shall reign forever and ever. Lord, give us the peace in our heart that the Prince of Peace is in control. And Lord, I pray that 
You'll help us to be confident and to trust you at all times. And never be afraid what man can do unto us. Father, have your will now and your way in each heart during this invitation. And I'll thank you for it.